nothing about the offspring is due to what the mother has done. Oh, and that okay. I think is a bit tricky. And so I tend to use guides or organizes or orchestrates, right? So yeah. there's you know, uh, uh, somebody that's leading an orchestra, they're shaping it, but there's also the role of each, each individual uh, musician and their instrument. Yeah. And so I think of it in terms of organization and um, rem remind me, uh, oh, cultural influences. So we know from the work of a scholar named Julie Manella that uh, we individually learn preferences for the types of foods and the types of spices that our mother eats, mm -hmm. that are a lot of times culturally anchored. And so we- So like flavors, yeah, there's, flavor um, preferences. Food critics or, or foodies will talk about the terroir, right, of a food that reflects how it was grown and where it came from and, and, and how it was processed before it makes it to your plate. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there is that same feature of breast milk okay. that reflects the mother. So if the mom's eating a certain type of food, then the baby's more likely to also eat that food. Because I guess he's, it's the type of food that would be in his local environment. Right. There would be an advantage to that. Yes. And, and a lot of it has to do with like things like, you know, preferences for garlic or these really strong mm. things that, that pervade, like spices, herbs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the different kinds of, it, it might not be down to like, I like spinach because my mom ate spinach when I was breastfed. It, it more might be like um, the leafy greens are more palatable mm -hmm. because yeah. I was exposed to leafy greens. So okay. the, the, the precision level, I think, is the science remains to be done. Yeah. But the, the cultural anchoring via breast milk is, is incredibly exciting. Well, that's, I mean, that was another key, I think, uh, thread through your presentation, that we're really just at the beginning. This <laughs> fluid that we talk about, and mm -hmm. you, you use nice terminology, it is a food, but it's also alive, it's a signal, it's a medicine. Yes. And we're really just on the cusp of starting to explore that whole concept. It's, it's astonishing the extent to which studying mother's milk has not been a funding or scientific priority. Yeah. Um, I think in part because people have taken it for granted. Mm -hmm. And and so this this incredibly complex fluid has been hiding in plain sight and really is calling out for, for um, sustaining and expanding the research that's going on. I mean, yeah. well, the research that's been done in milk is incredible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's informed us in so many ways that it, it's really the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. It, it, it lets us know we need to make this one of our big priorities. Mm -hmm. How can we be optimizing lifelong health if we don't know about the first substance a mammalian infant exactly. has been you know, evolved to consume? And, and that right there is a, a huge challenge yeah. for clinicians that want to give evidence-based advice for developing interventions for fragile babies in neonatal intensive care units. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, um, hopefully something that we will see continue to expand as we have in, in yeah. the last few years. Well, because I feel the breast that is an organ, yes. it does not kind of gain the same respect as other organs of our body. You know, this is this is something that I talk about quite a lot. Is people oftentimes, when they're messaging about breastfeeding, mm -hmm. they'll talk about how breastfeeding is free. Mm. And um, mm, is it free? It's, mm. it's only free if you place no value on women's time and energy, which we know from culture history mm -hmm. has has been an eternal struggle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to go there. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do. Oh, okay, please feel free. No, no, no. I mean, that's that that's something that I think. You know, when you know who sets funding priorities? Yeah. Right. What do they? What are their concerns? Mm -hmm. And who doesn't set funding priorities? Right. Yeah. And and so we find that um, mother and infant health has not received the due diligence mm -hmm. of research effort that that we need in order to to deliver on global public health. Mm -hmm. So, what does it mean to be alive? This fluid. Human milk oh, being alive. Right. What does that mean? It means that there are living things in it. Mm -hmm. So, I, right. Was a, <laughs> right. Um, and those things are uh, microbes. Mm -hmm. So, microbes that. So, it's got bacteria in it's it. It's got, um, yes. Uh, people, I think, think of bacteria as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But we now understand that many of these microbes have co evolved with us and actually do a number of, of incredibly cooperative, beneficial things. Yeah. Uh, they're not, you know, they, they, they help us digest our food, they help us fight our pathogens, 
they help and train our immune system. And we now understand that mother's milk helps to feed and colonize beneficial microbes within the infant's intestinal tract. Milk's also alive in that we now understand that, that, that stem cells from the mother are passing to the infant through milk. And, um, and, and some of these are, are uh, assimilating within infant tissue in exciting ways. So lactation or breastfeeding I mean, really, you could see it as the, the fourth trimester, right? There, what do you think about that? I hear it popping up, but people do think that the development of the infant is now separated from mother as soon as it comes out. Right, right? And, and you see this all, all uh, in the literature that mm -hmm. people talk about uh, physiological investment prenatally mm -hmm. during fetal life and behavioral care mm -hmm. postnatally. But as mammals, we know that that physiological investment continues into that postnatal period. and and. It's tricky for me to think of it in terms of trimesters because mm. pregnancy is 39 weeks, yeah. <laughs> and you know World Health Organization recommendations for breastfeeding is exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Yeah, which would be you know two trimesters. Okay, and continued yeah. breastfeeding for up to 12 to 24 mm. months. So it'd be the five trimesters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it gets complicated. It gets complicated, <laughs> and, and, in, and in traditional societies. Weaning doesn't typically happen until sometime between, you know, the completion of yeah. lactation. Weaning's a process, of course, until somewhere between two and three years of age. And so, um, I think if if we if we if talking about it in terms of trimesters gets more people out to three months of exclusive breastfeeding than they are otherwise, that's great. If it makes people start thinking about exclusive breastfeeding as as only three months, mm. then, then we're okay. messaging, I think. Right, right. No. Okay. Good, good point. Yeah. <laughs> Mathematical. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned a key thing there, which is actually a question that we've received from quite a few different people, mm -hmm. and it's really about that duration, kind mm. of how long should mums continue to right. breastfeed? Right. Yeah, should. That's a tricky word. It is a tricky word. Yeah. And, and um, I was very fortunate in my first media interview right as I finished my dissertation uh, a long time ago, that I, real, I really stepped back away from what mothers should do with their bodies. And, and you, know, you know that about me. But I think that you find that um, there's a lot of people have very strong opinions about uh, the uh, length of breastfeeding. So you've got very clear World Health Organization public health messaging Guidance on, on, first on where to get to, mm -hmm. um, to avoid it being you know uh, so short that it might not um, be as optimal as moms want to deliver for their babies. But on the longer end, right? There's huge variation. There's huge variation. Some moms will breastfeed for three, four, five, six years, and I've looked at the literature. The amount of, of nutrition and immune function and, and signal that that's providing decreases across time as babies eat more food, as they turn into toddlers and children. But some people have done research about that there can still be value in the bonding. And there's no evidence that there's any negative consequences mm -hmm. of, of this, um, what I call extended breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Some people call it full-term breastfeeding, but that also implies that that's the target. And the fact of the matter is, is that not every mother has the exact same target for a lot right. of really good reasons. Different and so mm -hmm. there's there's no one size fits all in terms of mm -hmm. the duration. And mm -hmm. I think it's a real important thing to keep in mind that, that every mom's navigating her particular life and landscape and and there's variation. So moving out of the opinion, because a lot of people <laughs> do have opinions, but going yeah. back into the actual components, yes. right? So sticking really to that. So what? It, how does that landscape of the milk change over time? You said there's no there's no bad exposure. Well, Having breast milk at any age is great, right? I wouldn't. So at any age, like a forty year old. I'm being I'm being yes, provocative you here. You are being provocative. <laughs> um, so we don't have great information about milk composition out at these you know three, four, and five year lengths. Okay. I've written about it on my blog yeah. at mammalsucklogspot.com, and <laughs> um, and, and and I wrote an essay called When to Wean. And it, it went through everything we know about milk composition out at these ages, okay. what we know about different cultures and when they introduce mm -hmm. foods, when they end the weaning process. And the, we really, we don't know a lot about those dynamics. 
Um, we do know that, that sometime between six and nine months of age, breast milk can no longer sustain growth trajectories, right? So we know that babies need more calories than milk can provide. And so, you know, is more milk, if they're not getting enough calories, a better thing? No, right? So you have in some situations, um, in, in, in some marginalized uh, communities, some babies will be breastfed exclusively longer than is most mm -hmm. healthy because the family can't afford Other. supplemental foods, right? And so um, as babies age, the amount that milk can affect them declines. So that's the other thing. They become more independent, I guess. They can, and, and their, like their gut becomes less Their porous. systems are maturing. Their systems are maturing. We don't know about the gene expression for mm -hmm. hormone receptors mm -hmm. within their gut. All great mm -hmm. scientific questions. Um, and do we anticipate that it would, that things would ever cross into a place where there'd be a negative value? No, but they could stop having any kind of positive effect. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, what, does that, mean for, what yeah. does that mean for the mom's, you know, somatic insurance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if she's still liquefying herself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned weaning. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question we had actually is, what is that process? So I think that's a really <laughs> kind of a, it's a really pivotal moment if a mother has been exclusively breastfeeding for six months and then she tries to stop. And it's yeah. not really stopping. Weaning implies that it's a, a process. Weaning in primates is a process. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that process is negotiated between the mother and the infant. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be culturally variable. So you've got um, some anthropologists, Barry Hewitt out of Washington State University has done work looking at um, Aka foragers from Central Africa and uh, Ngandu horticulturalists uh, that live nearby. And, and the agriculturalists, horticulturalists are weaning at about two years of age. The infants throw some, some tantrums. They seem upset. It's, it's, it's mother-led um, and they transition to these special weaning foods. If you look at the Aka, the weaning, um, kind of ends around four years of age. It's infant determined. They transition to adult foods. They don't seem to hmm. throw tantrums in the same way. And so it seems to be in many ways culturally anchored. Mm -hmm. One thing that our lab's becoming really interested in, as I mentioned that mom's milk feeds the microbes and, and uh, David Mills at UC Davis talks about milk oriented microbes. Mm -hmm. Your other mom, <laughs> great little acronym. <laughs> and that milk's feeding these microbes, and we know that microbes in our gut are releasing neurotransmitters, right? Dopamine, serotonin, these, these neurotransmitters that, are, um, that affect our mood and, and how mm -hmm. happy we feel. Mm -hmm. And the microbes release them, and they travel via the gut-brain axis to influence mood. And so when infants are being weaned and milk is being withdrawn, the microbes that depend on that are, are having catastrophic die-offs, right? And so there's a withdrawal. Yeah, the, they're having we, a tantrum too. So, or, <laughs> right, and, and that is what huh. we want to start working on. We know that these catastrophic die-offs in adults lead to precipitous declines mm -hmm. and withdrawal of, of, of these kinds of neurotransmitter hormones. Mm -hmm. We know less about it in infants and the weaning process, but everything we know suggests that, that, that those weaning tantrums are just partly the baby, and and likely partly mediated by these 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 die-offs of microbes that are relying on mother's milk. It's really it's really wow. fascinating to think about the the how <laughs> how the microbes hold mothers hostage. That's so cool. <laughs> that's just really that's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, a lot of research in this area still needs to be done. Yeah, but everything we know uh, suggests that that this is partly what's going on during weaning tantrums and partly explains why more abrupt weanings are characterized by greater amounts of conflict mm -hmm. and, and people self-report and things like that. Yeah. The slower weaning, you have a, a slower withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it, yeah, everything that comes out, it yeah. always just makes so much sense. Yeah. It's just right. I never even yeah. thought to look at it right. before. Yeah. It's oh, amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. So signal, the signal, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Now, you've talked a lot about signal in this direction, so the milk signaling to the infant. Mm -hmm. Now, what about in reverse? How much control does the baby have in this kind of two-way connection? Yeah. Is he signaling back at all? There, yes, definitely. Okay. So 
um, you know, infants demand, you know, infants, infants uh, notify mom that they're hungry, that they yeah. want something, and how moms respond to allowing nursing or providing milk, that, that shapes the physiology within the mammary gland, right? So milk synthesis is partly driven by milk flow through in the mammary mm -hmm. gland. So frequency and duration mm -hmm. of nursing are gonna shape how that mammary gland is right. functioning. Um, we know from Donna Getty's work um, that there is an, a, a vacuum mm -hmm. during the breastfeeding process. So when the infant is feeding at the breast, it, it creates baby spit backwash into the mammary gland. Now, that's what we know. We also know that when babies are sick, moms upregulate some of the immune factors in their breast milk. Um, now, is there something about the backwash and the saliva that comes back in and, 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 and bathes aspects of the mom's ductal system in, in an honest signal of what's going on with that baby? And, and we don't know. We speculate. All right, okay. We speculate yeah. um, that this is one of those pathways. But one of the other things that we return to over and over in biology, and especially in this, is that there's redundancy in these systems, mm -hmm. right? So you can get that backwash. But moms are also kissing their baby and hugging yeah. their baby and changing their baby's diapers. And so there's They're interacting many and, pathways right. by which mother's physiology gets information about the status of the infant. So right. this is just potentially one of those pathways. Cool. We have a question coming yeah. in on the live chat okay. from a mom. Uh, actually, now two. Oh, they're coming in hot. Uh, one of them was, uh, do you think there's any difference between milk that has been so exclusively expressed mm. versus baby feeding at the breast? So... I guess there's two different populations, right? Really an exclusive, so the baby's unable to do it right. versus the baby that can. Um, so, like, are there differences? Probably. How much do those differences matter? It depends. Um, so there's, there's research coming out from Jim McKenna and Lee Gettler um, and Helen Ball that talk about breastfeeding and co-sleeping uh, shaping the ability to make, like, sustain lactation right, and meet breastfeeding goals. Mm -hmm. So co-sleeping with the infant at the breast seems to help that. So that's going to be influencing the volumes of milk that are being produced, mm -hmm. how much sleep moms are getting, things like that. So feeding at the breast is a more interactive, dynamic process. Mm -hmm. Now, so if we're comparing expressed milk to that, there's a difference. But if for whatever reason moms can't feed at the breast, mm -hmm. is pumped milk of greater value than the alternatives to that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is largely yes. We know right. that milk has these complexities, these structures, and all these features that even when pumped, um, evidence suggests that it's quite important. Right. It will be really exciting as research in these areas expand that we get a better understanding of the mosaic landscape in which mothers are, are feeding their babies. So there's mixed feeding, there's pumping and feeding at the breast, there's mm -hmm pumping and having dad feed or, mm -hmm, or a mm -hmm. partner or another caregiver. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know that human babies are able to form bonds with multiple caregivers. Are, is the value of pumping and feeding breast milk from a bottle by another caregiver, yeah. does that help with emotional and social resilience within those babies? We can only speculate right now, mm -hmm. but it seems I, that's the case with a lot of these different avenues of questioning, honestly. Yeah, we yeah. have a, a question coming in, actually, um, a response to your backwash Ooh, one, okay. asking whether or not the baby saliva backwash theory has been proved. And that they had read somewhere that it was really theoretical. So we know that there is backwash. We don't know if the backwash is a signal that the mammary gland Doing responds anything. to. Doing right. Okay. All right. So we know, we know that there is... Uh, a vacuum pullback so that the milk and saliva from the baby's mouth is flowing back into the ductal system. What that's doing inside the mom is what is speculative. Okay, all right. Um, is there one more? Oh, just someone saying that the actually the feeding the microbes part and the weaning was just really, really, um, I guess, relevant to this <laughs> mom at this particular point in time. So I guess we're talking about the right things. <laughs> and and I've, I've written accessible essays and comic strips oh. about um, that people can find at really? the blog. Yeah, I did a comic strip about how babies get buddies. And it, it talks about the the pa different paths <laughs> by which microbes... The microbes are the buddies? The bu yeah. Get, babies get buddies. And, I love and, that. And so you, you know, like, are the, are the microbes, are the babies exposed to the microbes? Yes or no? Are the 
oligosaccharides <laughs> fed to the microbes, yes or no? What's cool. going on in terms of all these different kinds of things? Are they yeah. getting, you know, breast milk or not? And, yeah. and so you have these kind of like these different paths, you know, like like all the news articles, you know, they do those <laughs> kind of paths, yes, yeah. no kinds of things. We did. I did a comic strip of milk and, and microbes. Very cool. Um, one thing you touched on towards the end of your presentation mm -hmm. was the difference between milk that mums produce for a baby boy mm. or a baby girl. Right. So I wonder, maybe you can elaborate on that briefly, because my next question is going to be, what if a mum has twins, <laughs> one's a boy and one is a girl? Right. right. So uh, what we found in rodents, kangaroo-like species, monkeys, humans, cows, uh, red deer, is that the, the recipe by which the mammary gland is making milk seems to be different if it's producing milk for a son or producing milk for a daughter. So we're, people have published differences in the minerals right, that shape skeletal development. We know sons and daughters have different uh, rates at which their skeletons develop. See it in, in uh, hormones, in fat, in protein, in mm -hmm. all these different areas. And, and it, it's not to me necessarily that mothers are favoring sons or they're favoring daughters. It's that when sons and daughters have different you know, biological priorities or processes mm -hmm. or developmental trajectories, mm -hmm. the milk is tailored to that. Right. And uh, there was a paper that came out just a couple months ago that looked at, it, it was really cool. This is a really big <laughs> analysis of, of archival public health data. And it was a twin study. And so you had identical twins and it looked at uh, boy, boy, in humans, boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, mm -hmm. twins, and then whether or not they were breastfed or formula fed. Okay. If they were formula fed, the, the girl and a girl, boy, twin grew the same as, as, as girl, girl, twins. Okay. And the boy and a boy, girl, twin grew the same as boy, boy, twins. They all grew the same. If they were breastfed, though, if the twins were the same sex, they grew better if they were breastfed than if it was a boy-girl twin. Really? Yes. And so this suggests that the tailoring of milk is oriented around optimizing growth. Mm -hmm. Tailoring is toward uh, improving growth trajectories. Mm -hmm. And that when you have a son-daughter mixed pair twins, that sex-specific signal gets muddy. It gets you know, blurry. And it's not precisely tailored to either sons or daughters, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And their growth is a little, we're talking about like an inch difference in adult sure. height, right? Sure. Like not, this is not, you know. They're like, all growing well. They're it's growing well. It's not a question of that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, you know, it's, it, it, and it's, and it's, it's not the difference between being like, a, you know, a yeah. racing jockey or an NBA star. Right? Sure. Like, no, no, these yeah. These are small differences. <laughs> but they are a really exciting clue yeah. about the ways in which milk is a, a tailored, unique, mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. recipe for that, that time and place for those babies from that mother. Yeah. I think you said in your talk that we're kind of discovering all the tricks mm -hmm. that milk is doing to mm -hmm. do all these really cool things that you're discovering. Right, right. right. Like uh, how, how do things combine? How do they interact? Uh, how, how do infants use them? Mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm quite interested in, in hormones in milk. Like the hormone cortisol, which people think of as a stress hormone, but they shouldn't because it's, it's not just about stress. It's about responding to challenges, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. Responding mm -hmm. to challenges is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so we find that cortisol in milk in the monkeys, it co varies with fat and protein, and it is implicated in better growth, a more cautious personality, and faster cognitive development hmm. in the monkeys. So when people are like, oh, is cortisol in milk bad? It's like, it's not bad or good. It's, it's seemingly orchestrating developmental priorities between behavior, cognition, and, and physical growth. Mm -hmm. And, right, like, it's, it's, it's like, you know, what, what is, you know, better, rock, paper, scissors? Right. Well, like, they're all good, and they all, <laughs> you know, have challenges. And, and, we can't and that's part of the orchestration, yeah. right? Like, it's not... Because they're interactions, right? Interactions. It's all these combinations of effects, yeah. right? Yeah. Cool. 
Another one, come in. Okay, so since it, milk is produced tailor-made for specific babies, mm -hmm. how does it work with tandem feeding, mm -hmm. multiples, even wet nursing, and especially in a situation where siblings are fed randomly from each breast? Yeah, um, it will be really exciting when we have better data on that. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that these are complexities. Mm -hmm that we don't have good data on, but um, we, we don't know. Right. Do I think that they're, you know, they're catastrophic? Do I think that they, like, these are small, these right. are small kinds of changes, mm -hmm. and, you know, breastfeeding is, is, is a huge, if, for the moms that are able to sustain breastfeeding and meet their breastfeeding mm -hmm. goals, I mean, there's a lot of things that trip moms up that are outside their power, and so I don't, I don't want to in any way trivialize that reality. Right. But in general, these, these are important complexities. It'd be really great if people research them. But like I said in my talk, we still don't even know what all is in milk. We don't know how it all gets there. We don't know what it all does in the baby under you know, these very kind of specific right. kinds of you know, standard you know, singleton being breastfed right. by the mother. Kind of getting deep there, huh? Right. right. Yeah, and, so, and then asking about all these permutations they're great questions. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. But yeah, more work yeah. to be done. More work I, to be yeah. done. And I think that it's, in essence, that's the whole thing, right? We're <laughs> saying that there's all these new questions, all of this uncharted territory ahead yeah. of us, which makes working in this field so exciting. It does. And what I think is really striking about this field is that there are so many unanswered questions that the researchers in these areas are incredibly friendly. Mm -hmm. We collaborate, we work mm -hmm. together, we share Very information. Multidisciplinary, right? We're multidisciplinary yeah. and it's not it's not competitive. It's you know, people people are deeply committed to understanding these things because it helps answer people's questions at home. It helps guide care in neonatal intensive care units. Mm -hmm. It helps guide, you know, public health interventions and and people really they want they want the solutions and they work together as much as, as is sustainable to accomplish them. And it's really impressive. It's a great, it's a great field to be in. Fantastic. I mean, I think we're really at the end of the interview. Okay. I think that's such a great way to end <laughs> it. I mean, your passion for what you do yeah. is just, just so, you know, oh. we're like absorbed by it. It's really, <laughs> really fantastic. So thank you for thank all that you, you do do. And for, for that collaborative work, it, it really, you can see the, the strength and the benefit in what you're talking about yep. because it's really hitting from so many different angles. Yeah, I'm, say. thank you for having me. As, as was mentioned earlier, it's been really great to be here to hear the questions from the audience. But I've really, we've been watching all the scholars here interact with each other and being like, well, yeah. what about this? What about this? Like, and you can so see many ideas. New avenues. Like from the here. seeds are planted here. Yeah, it's very exciting. Thank the you seeds so are much. Planted. No yes. problem. Thank you. All right, thanks. <laughs>